Well, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians 4 today. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. And let me tell you up front, this is a very convicting study. Um, if you want to leave, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. It's a, it's a very direct study that uh, is going to be based uh, out of this chapter, verses 1 through 8. But it's very practical as it speaks concerning what it means to love one another in a very practical way. You'll see that in a moment. But I wanted to prepare you because first service as I gave it, I realized that this is, this is a heavy study. This is the kind of thing that, that causes people, uh, and, and sometimes rightfully so, uh, a bit of discomfort. And uh, you'll see what I mean in a moment. But <laughs> we'll begin by reading verses 1 and 2. I'm going to give you the normal introduction I give to you as we enter into a portion of Scripture. Then we're going to move into verses 3 following to verse 8. So I'll begin reading at verse 1 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll read to verse 2, give you your introduction, and then move into our Bible study. Paul writes, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. And so Paul begins with the word finally, which is an interesting way for him to write because even though he's, uh, he's making it seem as if he's about to conclude, he actually has quite a bit more to say. So he begins by saying, finally, brethren. Uh, but what he's going to do is he's going to encourage and comfort the church. Because he's going to speak in this chapter concerning something that we're going to take time to look at in a couple of weeks called the rapture. And he's wanting to encourage and comfort them because of the things that they're going through. He's going to point out to them that the Lord will remove his church in a sudden way. And they're going to be caught up with those who have preceded them. He'll be sharing about that. But that is going to be a form of encouragement to a church that is undergoing persecution and affliction. And so he wants them to know that uh, there's a purpose in all that they're going through. And we'll see that as we go through this chapter, especially within a couple of weeks and we look at this event that he'll be pointing them to called the rapture. But as we begin our study in uh, chapter 3, uh, Paul had closed chapter 3, verses 12 to 13 especially, with a prayer. And he had prayed that they would increase in their love. He, he had prayed there in verse, uh, verse uh, 12. I'll read verse 12. Uh, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So Paul has prayed for them, and as he's praying for them, he's praying that they may increase and abound. I want you to notice that. Again, when he says that you may increase and abound in love, uh, he's saying may you continue to increase in love, and may you increase so much that your love abounds or it flows over. You see, being under persecution could have affected uh, and diminished their love. Their suffering could make uh, become the center of their own um, personal needs that could take over and so he wants them to realize that that they need to instead of hating those who are oppressing them that they ought to grow in their love and all not only for those who are are, are part of the family of God but also even for those who have been oppressing them you see on the one hand love for our fellow believer is something that is foundational remember in John 13 that Jesus had said in verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. He went on to say, by this all, shall, all men shall know that you are my disciples. So the mark of the believer, the earmark, or the birthmark, if you will, of a Christian is loving one another. And so he wants them to abound, to superabound. He wants them to overflow with love for one another. Because loving one another is a great testimony to those who are outside, to those who don't know the Lord. When they see Christians who actually love one another and they don't bite and devour, they don't consume one another, they don't 
do those kinds of things, backbiting all, when they see that believers actually love one another, that's a great testimony. Loving people in general is a good thing. Loving your brother and sister in Christ is a spiritual uh, demonstration of the love of God, the love of God that has brought you into a family of those who also love him. And the love that you have for one another, and I know that it's difficult for us to do that, but the love that you have for one another is really a demonstration that God is really the center of your life. I got saved in a, in a, a time called the Jesus Movement, also called the Jesus Revolution and so many other things. But that was one of the things that drew me to faith in Christ. Is, is not, it wasn't just the theoretical love of God. It was seeing it in a practical way. It was being around Christians who were caring and giving and sharing and and, and coming out of the hippie background that I came out of where, where we talked a lot about love and peace and all of that. You know, you didn't see much of that amongst the hippies. It, we, we like to, those of you who are young, you, you might see, uh, see videos or movies that, that contain the hippies. And, and we all ran around saying, oh, that's cool, man. I love you, bro. And, you know, that's the way we were. You know, peace, love, yeah. Uh, all of that garbage. We, we did that. And, and I'll accept we didn't really love one another because we took advantage of one another. You know, when you do drugs, and those of you in this room who admit to doing it, those who don't admit, you know you did this too. Um, <laughs> it, wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a loving environment. Yeah, we're all bro and this and that, yeah. But, you know, I would steal some of your stash in a heartbeat. I wouldn't think about it <laughs> because that's what we did. And so I came out of that environment and so when I was around people who didn't want something from me and actually gave, I could not compute that. It, did, it, I, I, it just made, made no sense. And so the first time I went to a, a Bible study, a church service at Calvary Chapel, when it was in a small uh, little chapel in uh, Santa Ana, Costa Mesa, and the first time I walked in there barefoot in a little high, drinking some beer and smoking pot and all, when I walked in and I, I, I sensed something in that room with all those kids that were, it's, they spilled out onto the floors and up to the, up the platform. There were hundreds of kids and young people, a lot of, they were young. And when I experienced that, I didn't have a clue what I was experiencing. It was the love of God. And so Jesus made it very clear. He had said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And see, that's what Paul is talking about. But not only do you love one another, you don't love just those of us who are here in this room who are also believers, but you also love those who are outside. He, he, he prayed that, that their love would abound to all, which is a general duty. That would include loving those who were afflicting them. And that would be especially difficult. But he commanded us to do that. Christ said it in Matthew 5, Listen to this difficult saying of the Lord. I say unto you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. May your love abound. May the Holy Spirit rest on you in a rich and deep way, provoking you to have love for your brethren, but also to be concerned for those who are outside of the body of Christ, even your persecutors even those who are hurting you. Now we look obviously at Jesus as our greatest example, but Paul also is a great example. He, he said that they should love one another just as, just as we love you, that you ought to walk and please God, but you ought to love one another like, like we, play, uh, we love you. In 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, in verse 8, he had said, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. I have faithfully, is what he's saying, sacrificially preached to you under extremely difficult circumstances. I haven't changed the message. I proclaimed it faithfully because it's a message that brings salvation. I did it with a sacrificial heart. I was willing to endure whatever I needed to in a sacrificial way I was willing to do this so that you would come to faith in Christ. I was willing to love you with everything within me. He said, he said, I was willing to impart to you not only the gospel, but my own life. 
which is John 15, 13, where Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. He said, I was willing to do that for you. And when I went through all of that difficulty in Thessalonica, when I had to leave because it was such a problem place, I still, being absent, longed to see you because I wanted to bless you. And so he's praying. He had prayed that their hearts would be noticed again in verse 13, blameless. He says, in holiness, blameless. Uh, it speaks of, of no charge being able to be lodged against them. Holiness speaks of a, a purity of heart. It's not simply the outward, which would, would be godliness, but it's the inward, which is a state of holiness. So he's saying, may that which you do emanate from that which you are. And because you're holy, your life will be without charge. It'll be blameless. And, and may God do a work in your heart. Remember the heart in the New Testament is very, uh, very clearly, as well as the old, obviously, uh, demonstrated, the heart is demonstrated to be the seat of all behavior, all sinful behavior. And in, in Mark 7, 21 and 22, Jesus said, for for from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. It's the seat of your behavior. Now, they had come to faith in Christ, and as a result of that, they had received a new heart. In Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, God promises, I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You're, you're going to be obedient to me, not simply because you see my commandments on tablets of stone or written on scrolls and you see no you're going to be obedient to me because I will write that on the tablet of your heart so from within you will not want to have covetousness from within you will not be walking with, with uh, greed or, or desire to murder or commit that adultery or whatever because I will give you and this we all need I will give you a heart transplant I will give you something that is brand new something that's not your nature, I will give you a new nature through the born-again experience. You're going you're gonna to be filled with, with God's love, is what he had said. And he's saying, I pray that God will be revealed through your life. May you be blameless in holiness. May the fruit of the Holy Spirit be evident in you. Now, it's not just for the Thessalonians. I mean, the scripture is written directly to a church there in Thessalonica, but it also it applies to us. We're believers here in the 21st century. And, and Paul's desire wasn't just for one group in one area. It's, it's for the whole body of Christ. In Philippians, another book in the New Testament, chapter 2, verse 15, he said to them that, that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Uh, this... Uh, image in front of me. I don't know what you'd call it here on, the, in, on my podium. You can see it, the light bulb. If you're way in the back, it, it probably looks like frog eggs or something to you, caviar. <laughs> and I was there looking at that, and I'm saying, you know, I love artists because I don't always understand what they're putting down. Uh, I don't know what this is. So I asked John, who's a brilliant artist himself, and and what is that anyway? <laughs> and so he found out. And uh, I think it's cool. So I'm, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I, I, I just want to, I guess. And well, you see in the, the light bulb in the center, if you look closely, they're all light bulbs. And there's only one that's lighted. All the rest are not. Because we're shining as a light in a sin darkened world. That's what that is. And that's what Philippians is talking about. He said that we will shine in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And so that's what we're to do. And that's what his prayer is. He's praying that they, that they will live in such a way. We're going to see this develop in a moment. 
But he's praying that they're going to live in such a way. And not only that, that they're going to anticipate and be prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ who's returning. You see, if they really believe, and here's the key, if they really believe what God has said that he would return, then they ought to be awaiting him and their lives will evidence that because the genuine expectation of being with the Lord Jesus Christ is going to provoke a way of life. You know, it's one thing for me to say, oh, I think he's going to come back. It's another thing for me to live as if he is. And so when Paul was writing, for example, to Pastor Titus in, in chapter 2, verses 11 through 13 of the book of Titus, he said, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. So grace teaches us something teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's grace teaches us to live in a certain way. We deny ungodliness. We don't have worldly lusts that rule our, our hearts, but we live soberly, righteously, and godly. In 2 Peter, the apostle in chapter 3, verse 12, said it like this. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? And then he answers it. You ought to live holy and godly lives. Well, that's what Paul is talking about. You see, if we believe that the Lord is returning, our lives will evidence that simply because we live as if we believe that. And that's what he's leading up to. He desires to give them more attention in order that they're prepared to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're awaiting his return, but they need to continue and develop in their walks. And because this is so important, he's expressing his concern for them. Again, I mentioned this to you already as we've gone through 1 Thessalonians, but false teachers who have been moved by Satan have come in and they're beginning to undermine their faith. They're now suffering and Paul knows that false teachers can capitalize on their suffering. So they need to be reminded that the road to heaven includes trials and hardship. And that's something that every Christian ought to know. You know, sometimes you may hear a gospel presentation that gives you the impression that once you get saved, everything's fine all the time. You never go through any difficulty. But the Bible doesn't teach that. When, when Paul was, uh, was ministering, he very often would let people know it's going to be a tough life. It's not an easy life. It's something that we believers need to understand. In Acts 14, 21 and 22, it says, they preached the gospel in that city, won a large number of disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said, and that's true. Well, false teachers can undermine their faith by claiming that believers shouldn't suffer. So that's something Paul's addressing, and I'll do that throughout the letter. He's pointed out that afflictions are part of what is, 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 is part of being a, a believer in Christ. So instead of destroying faith, afflictions are part of our lives. Why is that? Well, they, they serve to deepen our faith, they refine it, and they make us more focused on the things of the Lord. A great teacher of another day, Charles Spurgeon, once said, most of the grand truths of God must be learned by trouble. They must be burned into us with the hot iron of affliction. Otherwise, we shall not truly receive them. And that's true. That's something my generation understands. That's something my father's generation and generations prior understood. That we don't have a perpetual happy day. That you go through difficulty and affliction and suffering. That's part of life. But instead of it defeating us, it strengthens us. It refines us, purifies us, and it makes us into what we've always desired to be. And so that's what we've been looking, up, looking at up to this point. That's your introduction. Let's get into our Bible study. In verse 1, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So Paul has been, as mentioned, exhorting them to remain faithful under persecution, but he is about to 
uh, exhort them to remain faithful under what would be called socially acceptable sins. Socially acceptable sins. Persecution refines you, but socially acceptable sins will actually undermine you. When you're going through tough times, who do you have to hold on to? You hold on to him most deeply. But when you're in an environment that approves of certain things and think they're normal, it's very easy for us to flow with that culture. And so Paul is going to speak about things that are acceptable to the Gentiles. And so he's, he's saying you need to remain faithful under these socially acceptable sins because that's a practical expression of walking in love, being blameless, and walking in holiness. So Paul is urging and exhorting them. And this is really a picture of a, a gentle command. He's urging. The word urging, he's requesting them as a brother. But when it says he's exhorting, he's pleading with them as an apostle. So he's encouraging them to walk and to please God. What's that mean? Well, they're to completely live for Christ. They're to have a life, he says, that is walking worthy of him. They're to please God in every way. And that's so important that he, he uses his authority to urge and exhort them. His plea is that they would abound more and more in the things they've received, that they continue, in other words, to mature in their walks with the Lord and steadily grow in Him. He's saying, hey, the things that you've learned, do those things. When we come on a Sunday morning, you get a Bible study, you come on a Wednesday or whenever it is that you're in the Word with your church family, it's not just to give us information, it's to exhort us to do these things. It's like when Jesus was speaking on one occasion and he said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I, I've had people who have spoken to me over the years more than once where they, they've said, I'm going through this situation and these are the things that I'm dealing with. And, and as I've spoken to them, I've said, you know, the word says this. And I've had them say more than once, say, well, I, I know that. And that's why I quote out of John 13 where Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Remember, I've said this to you before, but I'll say it again very briefly. During the time of Christ, and when you looked at the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, especially the Greeks and the Romans, when, when you look at their philosophy, the philosophy of the Greeks and the Romans was very basic. It was, it was that, the, that knowledge was the accumulation of information. So if you had a lot of learning, if you sat under a particular scholar or a mentor or whatever you want to call it, if you had somebody sharing with you philosophic truths and all, that you were growing in wisdom and all and knowledge because you were acquiring information. That's how it was. It's kind of similar. It's similar, as a matter of fact, to the American um, uh, method, <laughs> method of education. So you go to a class and, and the teacher lectures and, and says certain things, and you're going to need this because it's going to be on the test. And so for those of you who have gone to school, college, or whatever, you know that they'll say things like, this is going to be on the test. And so you make sure to put a little star or whatever, however, however you do your, your notes now. And you memorize that because it's going to be on the test. And so the question is asked in the test. You remembered what was, at, what was uh, stated. You write that down. And you just got a passing score, right? It's the spitting out of facts and information that in the United States, even to this day, which goes all the way back to the Greeks and Romans, it's a spitting out of information that, that uh, gives people the, the, the thought that, that you're educated, educated and knowledgeable. But that's not how it is with the Jewish way of thinking. The Jewish way of thinking is if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Because it wasn't simply the accumulation of information, it was the doing of it. It was information and assimilation that produced transformation. So when you hear what God says and you do what God says, then you are blessed. And so if you hear a Bible study and walk out unchanged, you have learned nothing. What you have done is you've gotten harder to the truth. Because a lot of people, when they hear the Bible, as it's rightly divided, want to argue with it because there are pet sins that they enjoy. And to hear the thing saying something, the word saying something they don't like, they get upset with it because at one point they like that sin and therefore I'm not going to give it up. So all they're doing is gaining information. They may be able to say, oh, I heard this and that was said. 
but that is not transformation. So Paul doesn't want them just being informed. Paul wants them transformed. And that's why he's exhorting them in the way he's doing. You ought to walk and please God. You have received this, and I want you to abound more and more. He's instructing them how they, as a saved person, is to live. They've been taught. There are things they already know, but they have to live a life that pleases God. They need to remember that what they've been taught and their faith in what they've been taught will inform them concerning how to live and when lived out, produces a way of living. It's called your walk in Scripture. When I first got saved, people would talk about they would use what, what I learned to call Christianese. It's Christian language. It's kind of a code. And I can still remember as a brand new Christian sitting there, and I still remember this exact thing. We would sit in, hippies would sit on the floor. We didn't need couches or chairs. So we're sitting on the floor in a front room. And this young woman was saying, today is my spiritual birthday. I'm a year old in Christ today. A year old. And I was like three weeks old. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, wow, she's deep. She's a year old in Christ, man. She's like Moses and Solomon. I mean, this, she's so deep. But she said, before I, before I came to, to the Lord, she said, and I was living in the world. And she starts talking. And I'm sitting there. And this is a true story. I was sitting there thinking, what do you mean living in the world? I'm in the world right now. I thought, did I join a crazy group of people? Who, I, I, I didn't get it. So I remember turning to the guy next to me, and it's okay, because I'm brand new. What does she mean by the world? She said she was living in the world. Isn't she still in the world? What, what are you? And, and he says, oh, that's just another way of saying when she was unsaved, before she had a relationship with Christ. And so I had to learn Christianese. So when they talked about their walk, I'm very literal. That was the whole problem. I was literal. And walk, you know, I walk. No, no. Your walk is the way you conduct yourself in this world that you've been taken out of and transported into the world of Christ. It's a transformed life that we're, oh, okay. So that's when he speaks concerning how you're to walk. That's all he's saying. To walk means the way you conduct yourself. To please God means to, to desire to do that which is uh, accommodating his desires. In other words, we yield to his desires that we might please him. When you look in the Bible, there's so many scriptures that talk about walking. I'll give you a couple. Uh, when it talks about a walk. A walk that is, is spirit-filled is something we're called to have. In Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. A, a walk is to be known for good works. Ephesians 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A walk is earmarked by God's love. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. It's a walk of wisdom, Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeem the time. It's a walk earmarked by obedience to the word of God. Second John 6, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. Uh, it's a walk that's holy. Ephesians 5, 8, you were once darkness. Now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. It's a walk that's morally pure. First John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So he's speaking about the way we live. And he's saying in verse 2 that you know what commandments we gave you. Now, this is important to note when he says we gave you commandments. He's one in telling them, I've instructed you this. And these are things that are binding because Jesus has given him authority to give commands. And so he's saying, I have given you from the Lord divine orders concerning the way you live. And you're to live in a different way. It's like someone once said, a Christian must live in the world but he must not let the world live in him. And so we're to resist letting the world 
live in us so we obey the word of God. And, and what is God's command? Verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. So this is what God wants for you, to be set apart. Now look at how he speaks of this. I'm going to read a few verses to you. Verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who don't know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we forewarned you and testified. God didn't call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this, listen carefully, does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So this is the uncomfortable portion that we're going to be looking at together. This is the will of God, your sanctification. The world that they lived in as it is today was sexually immoral. But you as a believer are to be set apart from sexual sin. A life that is set apart, walking and pleasing God, is a life that is known for sexual purity. He says in verse 3, you should abstain from sexual immorality. Sexual immoral immorality, let me give you a little bit about that. Uh, when he speaks of sexual immorality, that speaks of every form of sexual practice that lies outside of God's revealed will, including adultery, premarital and extramarital intercourse. It speaks of homosexuality, incest, incest bestiality, and other perversions. Now, when he speaks about abstaining from sexual Immorality. we need to know that that was common amongst pagans. Sexual immorality was common, and the, the pagans had no problem with it, so it was common at that time. It still is. Uh, adultery and incest, incest was seen as wicked, but was not considered to be too serious. And it's possible that the Thessalonians still had a very lax, at least, attitude, if not practice, as it related to this after they had been converted. Now, it's not improbable because sexual restraint was almost unheard of in Greek culture. For the pagan Greek, it was unreasonable to encourage people to abstain from sexual uh, intercourse, even if you're not married to that person. So at that time, men could commonly find sexual pleasure outside of marriage. And culturally, sexual activity was lightly regarded and widely accepted. As a matter of fact, Paul deals with this when he wrote to the Corinthians. You might remember this because there were those who were arguing, and Paul had to deal with it in the Corinthian church, that they were arguing that sexual fulfillment is natural and it's neutral. They said it's simply an appetite. Listen, if you're hungry, you eat. If you're thirsty, you drink. It's just a natural appetite. It's a bodily appetite. And so the Greeks philosophized in that way. They said, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? If I'm hungry, I eat. If I'm thirsty, I drink. If I have a desire to have physical intimacy, I just do. What's the big deal? And that had infected the church. And so Paul had to write in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13, and he actually quoted their own, their own philosophy. And the philosophy was food for the stomach and the stomach for food. If you have a natural appetite is what that means, then fulfill it by eating. So food for the stomach and stomach for food. But he went on to say, God will destroy them both. The body isn't meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And so that was something that was common. Now, in our day, obviously, many have, many have rejected the idea of sexual purity. They do think, just like the Greeks, they, it's a natural thing to partake in. And in your Puritan, you have Puritanic upbringing. You have these weird moral codes 
And because of this lax understanding of sexual impurity, listen carefully, today approximately 40% of births in the United States are to unwed partners. 40% of babies being born are born to unmarried partners. Why? Because it's just recreational, right? There's never a repercussion, right? But all of these babies that are being born, some of them sadly don't even know who the father is. These are fatherless children. And we are in an epidemic here in the United States because of that. You see, the majority of Americans do not believe that fornication is a sin. There's a, a page called Statista. And in 2022, around 69% of respondents in the United States believed premarital sex to be morally acceptable. 69%. On the other hand, around 28% believe it to be morally wrong. Almost 70% of the respondents said, what's the big deal? That's America. That was just like it was in the ancient time. Even in the church, because this subject is not touched on, because many times the pastors don't teach through the Word of God, they teach out of the Word of God. In other words, they do topical studies. Because they're not doing a verse-by-verse -verse study, you don't touch subjects like this. What pastor wants to say, well, it's time to talk about fornication? Most pastors don't want to do that, which is why I appreciate just going through the whole scriptures. That way you have to touch on things that may be uncomfortable. I can remember years ago, before I was a senior pastor, I was an assisting pastor. And I did a lot of the counseling in the church. A phone call came in, and it was a young lady. She was around 17. And she had asked for uh, an appointment to speak to one of the pastors in the church. And, and so I was asked, could you meet with her? And, it was, and I said, yes. And I met with her after a Sunday morning service. Again, she was about 17 years old. And she was supposed to meet with me with her boyfriend, and so I waited, and she came to the office, and as she came in, she came in alone. There was no boy with her. So I said, I, I was under the impression that I was going to meet with you and a young man with your boyfriend. And she said, oh, he didn't come. And I said, oh, really, where is he? And she said, oh, he's playing football with some friends down the street at the park. I said, did he know that you had made an appointment for you guys to come in and talk? And she said, yeah. I said, why isn't he here? She said, he didn't want to come. He wanted to play ball. I said, oh, okay. Well, how can I help you? She said, I just need to ask you some questions. And I said, fine, I, no problem at all. I said, uh, do you go to this church? That's how I found out she didn't. She goes, no, I don't. I said, are you a Christian? She said, yes, I am. I said, uh, what church do you go to? She mentioned whatever that church was. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, why are you coming to me? She says, because I didn't want to take this to people in the church who knew me. I wanted to go outside of it to get a, uh, an opinion and, and direction from somebody that I didn't know. I said, that's fine. So I said, what's your question? She said, I just want to know about sexual intercourse outside of marriage. And I said, can I ask you why? She says, well, I've been involved in it with my boyfriend. I said, okay. I said, and at your church, do they teach you anything about that? And she said, no. So I began sharing scripture with her. I shared this particular scripture here that we're looking at today. I said, you know, the word of God teaches that that's called fornication. And I explained to her uh, the, the repercussions and all. But as we were conversing about that, I said, do you, I said you've never been taught this. She goes, no, they don't teach from the Bible at the church I go to. At the end of the conversation, I'll just gel it. I said this to her. I said, honey, I said, listen. I said, the boy you're with is not good for you. One, you told me he's not a believer. Two, you've told me you're a believer. So that's being, in scripture, that's called being unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. God forbids that. Secondly, you're involved in sexual sin. I had gone through scripture with her. You're involved in sexual sin. And the sexual sin that you're involved in, God forbids. Third, if that guy loved you, he'd be here with you. But he loves football more than he loves you. And you have violated God's word and you have violated everything that's holy. 
So you could be with someone who doesn't know the Lord who's taken advantage of you. I said, if you want counsel, here's your counsel. Break up with him. He's not good for you. Turn back to Jesus. He'll heal and forgive you and follow him. And she looks at me and she just kind of nods. Again, she's about 17. Who do I know? I, I was an old man to her. I was 29 years old. <laughs> what do I know? And so she left. After she left, I never saw her again. After she left, a few years later, this church, I'd already planted this church, I got a, a letter. It was, it, it, I can still remember how she began. She would say, you may not remember me, but I was a young girl sitting in your office crying with you about a boy that I'd been having sex with. And you counseled me to break up with him. I never came back to tell you how the story ended. She said, I followed your advice. I broke up with him. I got right with God. She says, I went to Loma Linda. I am now a nurse. While I was at Loma Linda, I became the president of the Christian club on campus. And I want to tell you, thank you so much for your counsel because I'm getting married to a man who loves Jesus Christ. And I want you to come to my wedding. See, telling the truth sets you free. Not everybody wants to hear that because we all think that the relationship we're in is the best thing that God has for us. But when it's outside of the will of God, you're not walking in holiness. You're not walking in godliness. You're not walking in, in, in the spirit. You're quenching the spirit, and, and, and God deals with that, and that's a sad thing. You see, sex outside of marriage uh, is incompatible with a life of holiness. It destroys the foundation of intimacy that's established in what is called the covenant of marriage. The Bible teaches us that marriage, by virtue of creation, is God's design for proper sexual relationships. It's intended to be enjoyed between a man and a woman who are married. In Genesis 2.24, it says, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And marriage is intended for godly couples to produce God-fearing children. In Malachi 2.15, Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. You see, sexual immorality is a violation of God's intent for sexual intimacy. It destroys the marriage covenant, it leads to divorce, and it breaks children. In Scripture, sexual involvement outside of marriage is sin. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all, the marriage bed kept pure. God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Ephesians 5, 3, among you there there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. These are improper for God's holy people. So the believer is to live a life that is blameless and holy before God and man. Sexual relationships outside of marriage have repercussions. According to USA Facts, the CDC estimates that one in five Americans has an STD. One in five has an STD. Young adults from ages 20 to 34 have the highest rates of infection. According to Wheatley Institute, several recent studies show that having uh, several sexual partners before marriage decreases marriage quality. It destroys relationship satisfaction, relationship stability, sexual satisfaction, and emotional connection. These are repercussions that are serious but there's something even more. Because unrepentant habitual sexual sin eliminates you from heaven. In Ephesians 5, 5 and 6, this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Let no one deceive you. What are they to do? What are believers to do? Verses 4 and 5. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. 
Each of you should learn to control or have mastery over your own body, possess your own vessel. Devote our bodies as sacred vessels that are devoted to God, honoring to Jesus. Voluntarily, he says, abstain from sexual sin. He says in verse 5, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles. Notice, who do not know God. Unbelievers live unregulated and undisciplined life. Passion of lust speaks of abandoning self-control, being controlled by lust. Pagans have no concern about God's commandments or sexual purity. They don't know God. They haven't responded to him. And so they abandon self-control. There's there are people that will say, well, you know what? Yeah, I did. It's interesting that they will use the word fall. I fell into sin. I fell into sin. That's an interesting way to put it. Like I was walking with my girlfriend and we tripped over the bed. <laughs> and we fell into sin. <laughs> yeah, I went to the bar and I picked up a girl and we fell into sin. I've had them say things like this. You know, Pastor, you, you need to understand that, that when, all the, when all the bells and whistles, when everything's going off in me and everything's go, my body is saying, yes, I can't control myself. I, don't, I can't control myself. The passion just takes over. He's speaking about passion of lust. You know, it just, it, every, you know, all the lights are on and systems are go. And, and then you ask, okay, so you're saying you have no self-control. You're saying you have no self-control. I'm, I'm just saying that I can't once, once I pass a certain place, really. And, and what if she told you that she has AIDS? Oh, I wouldn't. Oh, wait a minute. You just told me you have no self-control. So your fear of AIDS is greater than your fear of God. Is that what you say? Your fear of getting a venereal disease is greater no, you have self-control. You're not exercising it. If you're a believer in Christ, he has given you the power by the Spirit. One of the best things you can do if you're single and dating, one of the best things you can do is pray before you go out on your date and dedicate the date to God. It's better to pray before than to repent afterwards. Father, in Jesus' name, we're going out. Lord, I just ask that we might remember you. How hard is that? How hard is it for you as a believer to actually exercise self-control? Because you can. Problem is, why would I? Why would I? When everything's a go, she doesn't care. I don't care. This is good. God will forgive me later on. And the child that can be bored from that or the abortion that she decides to have after that you're telling me that God is pleased with that? You see, that's what the kind of thing that was taking place when Paul said to the Thessalonians, don't let the world creep into the church. Don't let the world and its lax sexual mores dictate the way that you look at each other. Exercise the self-control that God has given to you. Give yourself over to the Lord you see, in verse 6, and this is very practical, and we're rolling to a conclusion very quickly here. Notice in verse 6 how he says this, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. The word advantage, when he says no one should take advantage, the word means to cheat someone out of something that belongs to them, to exploit them. The word defraud it means to take what is, is rightfully somebody else's. What is he talking about? He's saying that a young man and a young woman, the young woman, young man, they meet each other, they begin to, and I'll bring it to 21st, uh, 21st century. They meet somebody, you meet somebody in a church service. And she's unmarried, you're unmarried, she's a virgin, and you are, will say that you're pure yourself. You get to, you start dating. And then you begin to do things that you shouldn't do. And I won't go into any weird detail, but you begin to do things that you shouldn't do. And it leads you to a place where you end up consummating a sexual encounter. Maybe several times, maybe just one. But you take the purity from her, even if she yielded it, you take the purity from her. 
Then you repent and you say, my God, this is wrong. I'm so sorry. But one day she meets a young man. She really loves this guy. But in the back of her life, she knows that she gave to you, gave to somebody else, something that belonged to her husband. And this believer who had relations with her and never married her, it was fornication anyway. Marrying her wouldn't have made it not fornication, but he gave up on that relationship, went off and did whatever he does, married somebody else. She ended up being used by you. You defrauded her husband of something that belonged to him, which was her purity. That was something she should have been able to give to her husband. She didn't. She gave it to you. And you're supposed to be a believer. And you took from your brother something that belonged to him. And for the rest of her life, you will be part of it. Even when the two became one flesh. Even though God forgives all the sins, everything. You're still part of her history. You defrauded her brother. And he says, is that love? Is that walking in holiness? Is that walking in godliness? Is that what believers are to do? That's the point he's making. You took advantage and defrauded your brother. And the Lord, he says, is the avenger of all such. You're going to reap what you sowed. God administrates fair justice and no sin goes ignored. There will be repercussions that do follow. And if you live in unrepentant sexual sin, that demonstrates you never knew the Lord in the first place, and you will receive judgment. Finally, God didn't call us, verse 7, to uncleanness but in holiness. Therefore, who, he who rejects this doesn't reject man, but God, who also has given us of his Holy Spirit. These aren't man-made instructions. These are divine commands. In rejecting the commands of God, you reject the God who gave them. And that's a very sober and serious thing to close with. If you reject this, you're not rejecting Paul. You're rejecting the God who gave these commands. And God has given Paul saying, gave us his Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit works in you. But God inspired the things that I'm commanding you from his scriptures. You're rejecting God's command because you would rather live in your lust than to live in the love of God. And that, I have to say, like I told you as we began this study, is very serious. It's a very serious thing. Love God and love your brother and your sister and live in holiness.